Welcome to this Raspberry Pi Foundation Computing Education Research Seminar Series. I'm Jane Waits and I'll be chairing today's seminar. It's really great to see people from all over the world who are joining. Some of you it's the morning, some of you it's the evening. I'm very excited to welcome you to this uh, second seminar in our new series on primary, that's K-5 Computing Education Research. And we're focusing on computing education for these primary age learners. So that's children aged age from five to about 11 years old. And so I'm going to introduce Jean. I am delighted to introduce Dr. Jean Salak from the University of Washington. Jean is a good friend of mine. We've spent time at various research events together and I'm always so impressed with her thoughtful and careful work and how much she cares about our teacher community and how children can effectively learn and that whatever background they're from. Now she's a postdoctoral researcher and computing innovations fellow at the University of Washington's Code and Cognition Lab. Her research interests include computer science education and child's computer interaction, particularly in justice focused computing for young learners. It's absolutely brilliant to have you here. And if you'd like to take it away. Uh, thank you, Jane, for the introduction. I learned recently that a postdoctoral scholar means different things in different countries. So I'll tell you that in the US, uh, a postdoctoral scholar is someone who has completed their PhD and are training to become faculty. I know that I think in the UK, it's a more, um, it's a different kind of position too. So I just wanted to clarify what that means because people have different terms for different things around here. All right, so let's get started. All right, so as shown by the many countries represented in this audience, there is a worldwide movement to increase youth access to computing instruction, and that has led to a ton of new curricula, assessments, and professional development to support these efforts. But increasing access isn't enough. So this is a graph from one of our studies where we worked with a school district implementing an introductory computing curriculum in all their primary schools. And in the US, um, primary ranges from ages six to 12. And they didn't just implement it in their STEM focused schools, not just their high performing schools, but in all of their schools. And we compared the performance of high, mid and low performing schools as designated by the school district. And in the US, school performance level is a proxy for the income and the resources students have, unfortunately so. So on this graph, you have the X axis, on the X axis, we have questions from assessments covering introductory computing concepts. And on the y-axis, we have average question scores from each school, and that's normalized to the high-performing school. That's why you see the leftmost bar of this graph is one, and the bars to the right are proportions with respect to the high-performing school. So the key thing I want you to notice is how the rightmost blue bar compares to the gray bar. So that's the low-performing school compared to the high-performing school. So notice how much shorter that blue bar is compared to the gray one. And we found staggering performance differences between the school levels, especially between the high and the low performing schools. So while it's great that there are many efforts to integrate computing into primary schools, we need to make sure it's effective for everyone, lest we perpetuate existing inequities in the worldwide push for primary computing. All right, so now that I've shared some of the motivations for this work, I'll talk about a tip and see learning strategy we developed that scaffolds learning how to program in Scratch. All right, so let me provide some context. So open-ended curricula are really common in primary computing instruction and especially with Scratch. So here's an example assignment from an open-ended curriculum. So all of these assignments tend to ask students to code from a blank, a blank slate and with a few starting questions. So in this assignment, students have to build their own band in Scratch and um, are prompted to start with one sprite and some music blocks. And this can be overwhelming for students who are new to coding and new to the Scratch interface because you know they just don't have a ton of guidance. They just they put a sprite and do these things. And we looked at the code of some students who were learning through this open-ended curriculum. And what we found is that not only did it perpetuate existing inequities in learning outcomes, which is the graph you saw several slides ago, but we also found that their code was much simpler than what you would expect after several weeks of instruction. It was largely 
one event block and then one action and there wasn't really much in their code. All right, so one way to make instruction less overwhelming is to provide scaffolding or different levels of guidance towards a learning goal. And a use modified create is a learn by example approach common in primary schools where first students are given example code, um, code written by someone else to illustrate how a particular construct works. So that's the use phase. And then they are asked to make a small change to the code. And that's the modify phase. And then lastly, they tackle a more open ended problem where they apply that concept. And that is in the create phase. So instead of creating their own code from a blank slate immediately, we show them example code that they can learn from, and then that builds up to them creating their own code. So this is an example um, modify task. So students are provided with some starter code. So that's what you see on the left. And the code isn't complete. So the students have to make some changes to it. And then students are prompted to make those changes to the code which is what you see on the right. So we give them suggestions for what to change in the code. And then this way they can more meaningfully engage with the concepts without being overwhelmed with starting from just you know, a blank scratch interface. All right, so before the modified task, we introduce an additional level of scaffolding in the use step called tip and see to help students become more observant when exploring example code. All right, so tip and see draws from theories of metacognition. And metacognition is basically an understanding of one's own thought processes. And it involves both self-regulation in learning and the motivational aspects of learning. And expert learners are metacognitive and strategic about their own learning. So they establish goals, they plan, and they motivate themselves towards their goals. However, this strategic learning is covert and to a less strategic learner, learner, the how of learning is not obvious, and that denies access to both the process of learning and the content of learning. And uh, learning strategies make these implicit processes explicit, and that's scaffolds that metacognitive, metacognitive thinking. And learning strategies enable a student to learn, solve problems, and to complete tasks independently. Um, tip and C guides students in exploring someone else's crash code. So um, we're going to dig into this a little bit more. So if you're unfamiliar, Scratch is a programming language popular with young learners where you program different sprites or characters on the screen using visual code blocks. And when you put the code blocks together, it makes a script and scripts are triggered by the event. And in this case, the event is when the green flag is clicked. All right. And tip and see is a mnemonic for students to remember what to do when exploring a new Scratch project. So it's kind of like PEMDAS, and I think BODMAS is what it is in other parts of the world for the orders of operations, but for Scratch. So the first have tip stands for title, instructions, purpose, and play, which guides students in previewing a Scratch project. And the second half C stands for sprites, events, and explore, which guides students in their exploration, exploration of new Scratch code. All right, the first half tip was inspired by previewing strategies from reading comprehension, which helps students set goals and activate prior knowledge before reading new texts. Excuse me. Um, tip guides students in previewing the different aspects of a new Scratch project before looking at any code. And at the last step, play, they run the code with very deliberate observations of the events and actions that occur. But what does this look like? So this is what tip would look like on the project page. So we would draw students' attention to the title, the instructions, the purpose of the project as a preview of what they will see. And then lastly, they observe the project as it plays. All right, and the second half C draws from strategies used in reading to help students recognize different kinds of text. And C guides students in finding code in the Scratch interface. So by clicking on the sprite and finding the event and outlines the process by which they can learn how to code by um, deliberate tinkering. So what does that look like? All right, so this is what C would look like in the code. So students can click on the sprites they want to learn more about on the bottom of their screen. 
And then after they click on their sprite, we prompt them to look at the event blocks that start their scripts. So they know what to look for and what to trigger those actions. And then lastly, they explore the code by making changes to the script and observing how their actions change. All right, so now that I've introduced you all to Tip and C, let's talk about what happened when students learned with it. All right, so we studied Tip and C in schools in Austin, Texas in the US, and we integrated Tip and C into Scratch Act 1, which is an introductory computing curriculum for primary age students. And a Scratch Act 1 covers the introductory concepts of events, sequence, and loops. And each concept was taught using the use modify create progression that I talked about earlier. And um, after the students finished the use modify create progressions, they were given end of unit assessments. And uh, fourth grade or ages nine through 10 for us in the US, classrooms were randomly assigned into the control condition, which received um, instruction that only had use modify create or the tip and C condition, which received instruction that had tip and C scaffolding in the use modify step. All right, so as part of the curriculum, students worked on scratch projects with guidance from worksheets. And these projects were designed to uh, practice the concept of focus for each unit. So the amount of guidance uh, depended on which phase of use modify create uh, students were in. So in the use modify phase, students would first use an example project to see what the code does and then modify the code to learn a new concept. So on this slide, you see an example project where students were exploring an ofrenda, which is inspired by the Pixar movie Coco. And in the create phase, students would code from a blank slate, but receive some guidance on what to code. And um, Worksheets had a set of tasks or requirements for students to complete. All right, so uh, this graph shows the completion rate of the requirements for each project. So the different scratch projects are on the X axis and the percentages on the Y axis. The control students are on the left in blue and the tip and C students are on the right in red. So the projects where the completion rate was um, because statistically significantly higher for the tip and C students are marked with asterisks. And we found that tip and C students frequently completed the same or more requirements than the students in the control group. And on the rare occasion where more control students completed a requirement, that requirement did not re uh, require much coding, such as just changing the sprite or changing the background in Scratch. All right, so, and tip and C students not only perform, outperform control students in their project, but also in the assessments. And uh, this graph shows the result of the, assessment, of the assessment on the loops unit. So on the axis, you just have the various assessment questions. And on the Y axis, you have the average scores normalized to the, to the tip and C students. That's why it's one. And that's because a lot of the questions have different scoring. So we wanted to standardize all their scores. So that's why it's all with respect to one. Um, and the tip and C students outperformed in all questions except two as marked by the asterisk. All right, great. So we had established that it works, but does it work for all students? So namely, we wanted to understand if it helped address the, equi the equity gra gaps that we found at the start that motivated its design. All right. So we found that the gap between students with and without academic challenges narrowed when using Tip and C. So on this graph, we have plots of the total scores for two end of unit assessments broken down by whether or not students face economic disadvantages. So in each plot, the leftmost gray and orange bars are students in the control condition and the rightmost blue and green bars are students in the tip and C condition. Now what I, I know this is a lot, but I know what I want you to notice are the middle two bars. Okay, so these bars compare the students who do not have economic disadvantages in the control group and students who have economic disadvantages in the tip and C group. So notice the overlap between, the, between these bars. What this, um, our analysis showed us that there were no statistically significant differences between these groups, meaning that the students who have economic disadvantages perform just as well as students who don't have those challenges when using the tip and C strategy. We found the same trend with students with disabilities as well, 
where students with disabilities perform just as well as those without disabilities when using Chip and C. Like take a look at the events in sequence, those bars are, be, are very, very similar as well. All right, the same trend also apply for students who are reading below grade level or below where they would expect them to read at their age. And they perform just as well as the students who are reading at grade at or above grade level or above their age when using Chip and C. And it also applied to students who had math proficiency below their grade level, and they also performed just as well when using the tip and C strategy. All right, so in addition to comparing students across whether or not they experienced academic challenges, we also compared students across cognitive abilities. So we used the Woodcock-Johnson tests of cognitive abilities. And for clarification, these tests are not malleable to instruction but to a student's development. And we conducted four tests of these cognitive abilities. The first one, the first two tests are numbers reversed and verbal attention, and those are for short-term working memory. The next one is pair cancellation, which is for pattern recognition. And the last one's for visual auditory learning or long-term memory. And uh, these tests have categories um, for the the for the co the co these cognitive abilities and they're called like low low average average high average and superior these are just their buckets for those scores that they have all right so this is a graph that's a little bit different from what you saw earlier let me reorient everyone so on the x axis we have the different categories of cognitive scores for pair cancellation which is the pattern recognition measure split up into if they were in the tip and C or the control condition. So on the Y axis, we have the, the assessment and the Y axis, we have the assessment scores. So notice that these bars are pretty much overlapping with each other. And we found that pair cancellation or pattern recognition abilities did not have any Im impact on computing performance, at least for this age group. All right, now onto the short-term working memory measures. So this is a similar graph to the previous one, but with categories along um, the numbers reverse test, which is a short-term working memory measure. So I, what I want you to pay attention to is the leftmost uh, gray bar of the tip and C group and the middle orange, blue, and green bars. So notice that these bars, if you look across the graph, overlap with each other. Um, what we found is that students with the low uh, scores and numbers reversed. So that means they have lower uh, short-term short-term memory abilities, they perform just as well as the control students with low average, average, and high average scores. All right, now we found a similar pat pattern with the other short-term working memory measure, which is verbal attention. Um, notice the overlap again between the bar for the tip and C students with the low um, verbal attention scores, and then the bars uh, for the control students with the low average, average, and high average scores. So we found that tip and C students with low scores on verbal attention perform, perform just as well as the students, the control students with the uh, low average, average, and high average scores. So these, what the, so what these two tests tell us is that when using tip and C, students with uh, lower short-term memory abilities perform just as well as students with the uh, more average short-term memory abilities. All right, so now on to the long-term memory measure, which is visual auditory learning. So we found a similar result to the short-term memory measures. So notice the overlap between the bar for the tip and C students with the low scores and the bars for the control students with the low average, average, and high average scores. So we found that uh, tip and C students with low scores on the visual auditory learning performed just as well as the control students who had low average, average, and high average scores. And this is very similar to the short-term memory results that we found earlier. All right, so in summary, um, we found for that part of for our TIP and C results, we found that students using TIP and C performed, um, like students in TIP and C completed more project requirements and performed better on computing assessments. And the students with academic ch challenges performed as well as students without those challenges when using TIP and C. And then students with lower short term and long term memory abilities performed just as well as students with average or high average abilities when using TIP and C.